And I am here for our very last in the series of TRF Tuesdays, talking about practical applications of attachment theory for parents. And I've enjoyed being with you all. This uh, last subject that we're gonna talk about is how to help a child who is out of control. We're talking about a child who is deemed as hyperactive, um, the bull in the china shop, the child who doesn't know their boundaries, the child who is always bouncing off of the walls and jumping off of the couch and things like that. So first, let's say that it's really important to figure out why a child is hyperactive. The reasons will drive what the intervention is gonna be. And so let me try to list some of the reasons why a child might be hyperactive. One of the main reasons is that their set point of how much stimulation they need is skewed a little bit towards the high end where what is kind of typical for the regular population, and I'm putting it in quotation marks because actually while it is a bell curve of how much stimulation an individual seeks out, it is completely not a matter of what is normal and not normal. And it can vary by cultures, but some people are set to a point where they need more stimulation in order to feel their body in space and in order to feel calm and regulated. And so they might be the kind of kids where everything that they touch, they need more pressure and more feeling and more sensation in order to get the same kind of sense of, ah, I know where I am in my body. I'm getting that, um, that tactile stimulation that I need. It, they need more of it than maybe their family members or the other kids in their school or um, their kids in, in the community. And so you might see that they are the kind of children who stomp, they jump, they crash into the furniture. Um, they really like to um, um, feel things. So they might grab things and feel things and touch things that they're not supposed to. And they're sort of compelled to do that. And so it feels like their motor is always running and that they're always sensory seeking. And that's what it's kind of called. And what you need to understand is the children are not doing that on purpose in order to be rowdy, in order to get your goat, or in order to somehow just get attention. It's actually a feeling inside in these children, and adults have this too, where you just feel like you're driven to get input, so get stimulation from your skin, from your other senses, like your nose, your eyes, um, and you are looking for that in order. It's almost like you're seeking um, that, that next um, input, sensory input, in order literally just to feel calm in your body and to feel yourself in space. And so when that is perceived as something that is a negative, like you're doing that on purpose, why can't you sit still? Why can't you keep your hands to yourself? Why can't you um, stay in your um, space in circle time? Why do you have to jump on your sister or jump on me on the couch? When you act as if it's on purpose, what you do is ascribe a negative perception in that child's mind. And then they begin to believe that they're bad and that they're doing it on purpose. So it's really important to figure out what is really driving the child's needs. And if it is that they are a sensory seeker, that they need more what we call either vestibular input, which is movement and feeling their um, body in relation to gravity or proprioceptive input, where they just need a lot of sensation in their body, including um, most importantly, like their joints. Um, in order to feel themselves and that what we need to do is give them those opportunities and understand how to do that. And then they will be more calm and they will feel more understood and they will less, they will do less uh, purposefully uncooperative behaviors because when you feel more understood, you lose the need to act out. So let's think of some things. Okay. One thing is if a person, if a child needs to feel their body in space, that means they need to be up against something. 
So they need to feel something. So literally, it could be as simple as when you are on the couch, get up and get real close to them and put your entire forearm, your entire hip and your entire thigh right next to them so that they have that feeling of here's where I am in space. Okay, so don't wait for them to pile on top of you, to poke you, to push you. That is the recipe for the behavior problem. Another thing you can do, put them between your knees. Like if they're sitting, um, if you're sitting on the couch and they're sitting on the floor, you put them between your legs and then just really stroke the top of their hair like this. Make it so that it's really felt and have that sensation. And also then do the same thing by pressing down on their shoulders and then do a really, really firm touch on their back. You can also do the same thing if they prefer it with like strong input to the bottom of their feet by really giving them a strong massage. Okay, so those are the kinds of things you have to do proactively and let them feel those feelings so that they can get to be made to feel calm before they start acting up. Another thing is they like to have things all on top of them, like really big, heavy pillows. And when I mean heavy, I mean, get the, the heaviest, biggest pillows that you can get at Ikea or, you know, some superstore, but they're usually like floor pillows that then that you set them on top of their lap and really like press down and press down. So they're piling um, um, like a sandwich and you can even play this game where you take one pillow and you put it on their lap or you can have them um, laying down and you can put it on their back um, and you say, okay, what is your favorite um, kind of sandwich? Oh, I know you like um, a salami sandwich. So I'm gonna take this piece and you can pretend that you're putting a, a piece of salami and you put it on their back and then you press it down and press it down and press it down. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm showing you the rhythm in my voice on purpose because part of what's gonna help them to regulate is the rhythm of the compressions. And so it isn't a fast game. Um, some people make the mistake where they think my kid is being silly. So I have to be silly too and match their level of um, silliness and chaos. That is a place to start, but your actual goal is to be animated, but to be rhythmic and organized in your movements. And if you can get them down to the floor and you can start doing rhythmic movements with compressions, you're going to get more of the effect that you want, which is the child needs to let go and kind of feel more uh, um, relaxed in their body. So you can stack on salami and then you can stack on lettuce and then you can stack on mustard and then you can stack on another piece of bread and you can put anything else on top and um, really give them that sense of their uh, the heaviness of the pillows. Um, and then there are people who can who purchase what we call the weighted blankets. They're just literally a blanket that is really heavy on purpose. And it just feels like that cocoon feeling that allows the child to say, oh, this is where my body is. This is where it ends. This is where the world begins. That's the kind of thing that they, they're looking for. <clears throat> okay, so that's if the child has um, sensory needs. And um, there's so many wonderful techniques that you can do at home. I would recommend reading uh, the book called The Out of Sync Child by Carol Kranowitz because it talks so much about the different sensory needs and categories of sensory input. And it gives um, suggestions of what you can do. Okay, so that's um, your best tool to find out how to prevent the behavior problems that come with kind of the, the hyperactive out of control child. Another thing is, it could be that the child, your child is acting hyperactive because actually they're really <clears throat> overstimulated, which means that they could be very sensitive and they hear and feel and, and, and smell things that regular people are, are um, not as reactive to. And so being um, kind of hyperactive, being a ringleader is actually a way to sort of compensate for that. 
And so they might, like if it's in a big room, like it's in a classroom or in the social hall at church or synagogue, they might run, be running around and um, creating a lot of chaos. So at that point, what you would need to do is you would need to go over to them and take them by the hand without yelling or without um, repeating the instructions, like especially not in an exasperated tone. You can't yell to these kids across the room several times and expect them to finally come and listen to you. It's not going to work. Okay. So you need to go over there. You need to physically touch them. And one of the things that really helps is to hold their hands and look at them and say, you know what, now we're going to take, um, we're going to see how many hops it takes to um, jump all the way to the, to that door and really lead them like, together. Say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven hops. Okay. Now here's what I want you to do. And you hold their hand and guide them, you know, to the next room, have them calm down with you by reading them a story, or um, they can do something like tactile, like play with Play-Doh, or just do one of the exercises I suggested uh, in my previous, you know, talks, like, like the um, pillow compressions, because they're actually needing to quiet themselves, but they need a co-regulating other and they can't do it by themselves. So one thing that people say is, well, you know, I'm trying to teach, I tried to teach them the techniques that they learned, you know, in, in, in preschool, like the, um, the little yoga techniques of mindfulness or breathing, but they can't do it themselves when they're hyped up. So you say, okay, breathe with me, breathe with me. You have to take your breath, ready? And then the kid is just kind of rolling around and jumping around. So what you could do is get them to um, actually get, um, have them seated in front of you and say, okay, you take a really deep breath. And if you blow me over on the count of three, we'll see if it blows me backwards. Okay, but you have to get them to really, really focus and speak in a slower voice and say one, two, three. So if they do it on your cue, you go backwards and you go, whoa. Okay, now see if you can pull me back up and actually literally hold their hands. This also stretches their hands and make their makes give them proprioceptive input in their arms. Okay, can you see on the count of three if you can blow me over even farther? One, two, three, and then, you know, you fall backwards. But what I wouldn't remember, what you don't want to do is get silly when you do this and get chaotic yourself. So those are the kind of things for a child who might be actually kind of overstimulated and they're acting like the ringleader or they're acting chaotic. They really need that co-regulation of you guiding them. Okay. There might be other reasons why a child is hyperactive. One reason actually has to do with trauma. A child who has seen violence, a child who is exposed to a lot of screaming and yelling or a lot of uh, a tremendous amount of uncertainty on, a, on, a, on, a, on an ex existential level. In other words, they really are fearful. They could use being chaotic and running around as a way of trying to control or avoid the, um, the, the chaos or catastrophe that they think is coming up. And it is something that they do, they might look like they're enjoying themselves and acting silly on purpose, but this is actually them um, managing their anxiety by acting hyperactive. And so when a kid does that, there really is, and, and the people say, well, how would you know? Well, so, I mean, certainly sometimes you would know if it was in the, um, you know, in the history of the child's uh, known history. Um, and sometimes, you know, people work with um, foster children and they don't know their history or children who, who might be adopted. Um, but you, you were, you would do very well to kind of really think about the child's history and were they ever in a situation where they felt like the adults really weren't in charge. You know, maybe they were in a daycare, daycare situation or maybe they were taken care of by older siblings. And it's not, 
uh, those circumstances happen and sometimes are unavoidable, but the child may be reactive to that, um, such, that kind of um, chaos and just feel like they have no other way of taking control. So one thing is for this kind of child, words are not going to be helpful. So do not give them, do not lecture them, do not give them a lot of choices and um, make them feel like it is their, um, like they're doing it on purpose. And, you know, what do you, do you want to do this or this? Or if you if you don't make the right choice, I'm going to have to make the choice for you. Those are things that are probably not going to work with a child who's fearful underneath. So the the best thing to do is actually, even though they're acting silly and chaotic in, seems like in a, uh, like they're doing it on purpose, I would treat them more like a, imagine an animal <clears throat> that's a wild animal that got trapped in a cage, in a, in a, in a trap and, and their, their limb is in a, a trap. They're more, they're thrashing around. And so you want to tell them you're not in trouble. You didn't do anything wrong. It's going to be okay. And then you just kind of usher them into a less stimulating room and just say, here, sit here. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. Do you feel like maybe that something bad is going to happen if, um, you know, since your brothers and sisters are running around, are you worried about something? And I wouldn't actually wait for an answer necessarily because I don't think that they're going to be able to say yes. You just are kind of guessing at the fact that there's an underlying reason. It could be that they're worried about something or that they, they're stressed. And so it's much better to just reduce the choices. Don't offer them a lot of words. Try to just kind of come at them. Often I'd like to come at them from the side. So you're not looking at them and making their eye, you know, meeting their eye contact like face to face, but more like at a 90 degree angle and ushering gent them gently to a, whatever is the least more um, stimulating area and getting them involved in anything that you can get them involved that's productive you know help me make the salad or um, come over here and and help me you know take a look at this um, photo album and what are we going to choose for the photos for um, what the family vacation or um, you're also going to be if you're if they let you just if you're able to stroke their back or to give them that same um, calming touch that we were talking about previously, that's really going to help them too. But oftentimes they don't want to be in the presence of another person because they still are scared. And so sometimes you might create for them um, an area in the house that's um, that's a, kind of like a cocoon where they're able to go into like a closet that you empty out from toys and, and, and clothes and make a little um, nest where they have pillows and stuffed animals, um, blankets and anything that can comfort them. Because actually some of these kids, they really need to calm down and regulate on their own. You'd like to be able to help them but when you get close to them, when they're when you're trying to calm them down, they might kick, they might even spit, or they might you know hit and get out of control. And so it's better to just offer them that place to cool down by themselves, and even offer them um, always offer them a drink. I know it sounds some people say, well, you seem like you're actually rewarding and taking care of nurturing a child that's being bad. It's very regulating to drink something because. Um, you know, going back to that infancy model, um, a baby only has the capacity, the only thing that they have to soothe and self-regulate is sucking and swallowing. So I like to do it with a straw, get them an ice, an ice cold drink with a straw and um, just let them um, calm down. But I think the thing that you have to remember is meeting them with anger is going to make, is going to exacerbate the situation. Uh, and it's going to compound the problem on several levels. So if you find yourself being really angry, you have to take a look at that yourself and really see where that's coming from and help yourself in some way by seeking help um, before you'll be able to intervene um, a, a, without that anger. So it's been truly my pleasure to be with you all. I'm really grateful that you came. And I hope you've enjoyed this series about practical applications of attachment parenting. And I hope to see you again in the future. Keep in touch and be well.